Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 542, being recorded Wednesday, May 1st, 2019. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Sebastian Beek. We're glad you could join us. Uh, we record this show normally Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern, and uh, that works out to uh, 2 a.m. UTC, now with Daylight Savings Time here in the U.S., um, you can find our live stream at YouTube. And then of course, if you can't join us live, we post the edited version of the show, usually the following day, uh, through our RSS feeds and at our website, which is pcpro.com. Speaking of the website, uh, if you've been with us, uh, recently, you've been hearing us tease that we've got a long overdue redesign almost here. The, the site is up. It's running on, on our development server. We're mirroring all the content over having everyone kind of train with it because it's a, it's, it's a big move. It's not just a redesign, but it's a, a migration from our old Drupal platform to WordPress. And so it's, there's a lot going on and uh, we think it's going well and we're really excited. I think we think it looks great. It's a good update, a lot of good functionality, easy to read, responsive design for mobile devices and things like that. So we're looking to probably launch that uh, this weekend, this coming weekend, at some point over the weekend, when it's the traffic's low, we'll we'll switch over the DNS and and see what happens. So please uh, get a chance to check if you get a chance to check that out. Uh, take a look. Let us know what you think. Some things may be broken. Some things may not translate because again, the way we handled content at the old site is very different from this new structure. So some of the legacy content might not look you know perfect, but we've done a lot of hard work to try to make it. Uh, as good as it can be. So, uh, like I said, just give us your feedback and, and be sure to check that out at uh, pcper.com. And sort of as a as a little sneak peek, uh, as we go through the show and we cover the articles, normally we're looking at the website. We'll be looking at the the new website uh, as we go through today. So, with the exception of one article, because Tim didn't get it into the new site in time. So, uh, uh, you'll be able to see a little taste of what the uh, the new site looks at uh, looks like as we go through the show here. Um, but, uh, I won't be televising the flogging of Tim though. Sorry. No, no, that's, uh, too, too intense for, for the internet. So, um, let's, uh, let's dive into the show. Uh, it should be a shorter, uh, show this week. I see Sebastian has just added something at the last minute. So let me <laughs> grab that and put that no, it'll here. Be, let's like, it's like two minutes, Jim. It's fine. No, no. I just want to make sure I got all the tabs in order. So, um, so let's jump in. Uh, last week. Uh, we talked about the launch of the GTX 1650, which is the like low-end $150 touring graphics card from NVIDIA. And the, the weirdness there, there's Sebastian's modeling for you. The weirdness with that one was that uh, we had the hardware ahead of time, but the drivers weren't there. So we, when the, sh the show went live on Wednesday, we hadn't had a chance to do our full review yet. So we had a little bit of a, a tease of some results, but Sebastian uh, knocked the rest of that review out and he's got uh, some results to share with us now on this new GTX 1650. And is this particular card is the MSI version. Yeah, the gaming... It doesn't have X. a DVI port, does it? No, it doesn't. Just no. two display ports and an HDMI. But hey, that's up to the, that's up to the vendor. This is one of those uh, add-in board only launches, partner launches, so... Uh, this is a new GPU, though, which is kind of interesting. And I don't know for sure because we didn't have a briefing or anything about this beforehand. So I didn't get the chance to ask questions. But TU117 is the GPU in this. The previous two releases, the 1660 and 1660 Ti, were both a TU116. This is a smaller die. It's 200 millimeters squared down from 284 millimeters squared. What's interesting is we're still a lot bigger than we were back in Pascal. The card that this effectively replaces is the, is the GTX 1050 Ti, and that was, even at 14 nanometers, 132 millimeters squared. So still a 75-watt card. In theory, this card can run off of the board alone, although the two versions of it that I've seen so far both have a six-pin power connector, so you have some more overclocking CAD room. These are more aggressively factory overclocked. The stock clocks for this, the boost is 1665. This particular one, I think, was uh, 1860. I'll have to double check that. But it, it does use a little bit more power, so it does need that 6-pin, but you get the, the better performance. And a lot of these cards you're going to see are going to be factory overclocked anyway. It's like the last two launches we saw. As far as performance goes with this, and this, just to round it out on the specs, 
it's four gigabytes of GDDR5 again, same as we saw with the 1050 Ti, and then only 896 CUDA cores, which is still a bump from 768 that we saw with GP107 on the 1050 Ti, but obviously well below the last card, the 1660 launch with 1408 cores. So you're at a disadvantage just right off the bat. There's just not going to be as much GPU power from this. And that's evidenced if you're watching the video, you've been looking at some slides. Not a lot to say about this, except that it is faster than the 1050 Ti that it replaces. Quite a bit faster, actually. But still nowhere near the performance of even an RX 570 4 gigabyte version and well below the performance of a GTX 1060 6 gigabyte and of course a 1660. So 149 for this is the list price. Board partners can do whatever they want. The two cards that I have are 169 and 179. This MSI card is 179.99 on Amazon. 219 is the base price of the 1660. So you're you're inching closer to that and I have, I would not be surprised if we saw a 1650 Ti or something and bridge the gap from the 149 price point up to that 219 that's a pretty big gap between those two right now so we'll see but i don't know how you guys feel about this it's is this enough at that 150 price point uh, over the old 1050 ti which actually came out in 2016 what's the price on the 570 the again 50? well the 570 Same. is like a wild card because it's they dropped the price before this launch i was mm -hmm. getting uh you know pr from amd saying hey you know the rx 570 is selling for just 139 i went to a uh, new egg right but when i published this and it was actually selling for as little as 129 so with cards selling in that 130 to 140 price range even though of course the 570 uses more power if you're not concerned about that if you don't mind using external power then the performance of the 570 even the four gigabyte model which i had here to test is significantly better than the 1650 at less cost so that's a problem i don't know if that's a permanent price drop from amd if they're just kind of capitalizing on this launch because they knew they had a performance edge but you know or they've got something coming for... out that's going to be sitting there at that price point soon yeah yeah that's true i mean they're if, if navi comes out and they've of... got something for 150 that outperforms this and they'll be sitting pretty or they'll force nvidia to drop the price sorry josh yeah it's uh no i think they've got plenty of inventory that they want to get rid of and uh yeah the the 570 has been inching down and down and down and down and yeah the rx 580 too even before this launch i mean it's easily attainable for 169 if not a little bit lower on on special sale days and for an eight gig card that that performs that well for well under 200 bucks and then you get two new games, the Division Two Gold and and uh, World War Z. Um, boy, AMD still got some, they got some firepower on the uh, sub two hundred, and and the RX five seventy is not that much lower than the RX five eighty. If you yeah. were stuck with Nvidia for some reason, uh, you'd picked up a G Sync monitor. You're just that type of person that has to buy from them, and you've got you know, one of those older cards, you know, it might sort of make sense in a way, like you're stuck with a 1050 or 1050 TI. I have an idiot friend who's bitching that this computer is really slow. He brought it over so I could take a look at it. He's like, yeah, um, might have something to do with that GTX 660 in there. I'm not sure, but that, that's the way I'm going. Uh, so if you're stuck that far behind and for whatever reason, you're still going with an NVIDIA, it, it's an upgrade. It is an upgrade from previous cards, but I, I just don't see the point when if you are patient and wait a week or two, you'll find an 8 gig 570 at the same price and you'll have a much better experience. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess there is the option for those. Like, I think we we did, you know, PC Poor with went back in the Ryan days, did one of those articles where he went out and said, you've got a pre-built system that doesn't have an extra PCIe power cable. You can throw a 1050 Ti in it. And was that the 1050 Ti that that it article was 750 was based on? Ti 750? But it was it was that classic card that doesn't require external power. And now your your Hewlett Packard that you bought at Best Buy can at least competently game at you know lower resolutions and lower quality settings. So that's something. And I'm guessing, yeah. Go, I'm, go ahead. I was just saying, I'm guessing this will be a card that we do see in some of those pre-built systems too. 
Mm-hmm. Like the, oh, yeah. the pre-built system that advertises that it can game will probably have some iteration of the 1650 in it at a lower price point, even if it is one that takes a six pin power connector. But, you know, I'm sure we'll see everything from low profile to, you know, like the half height cards. We'll see single slot variants of this with, you know, tiny, insanely loud fans and all that good stuff that we see in OEM computers. So they had, the, you know, they're hitting a price point, but the performance is like, I don't know. This is a very meh release. Yeah, and this does not have, uh, as I recall, the uh, Turing uh, NV NV encoding, hardware encoding, video encoding benefits, right? No, and I totally missed that on the review. Uh, It does not, apparently. So that's another, if if you're looking for that advantage that you could get even from the 1660 and 1660 Ti with offloading some of that to your GPU and saving CPU cycles, especially if you're using one of these to stream, this would not be the card to do that with. You'd want to get at least a 1660. Yeah. And that's interesting too, because NVIDIA made a big deal about, uh, you know, the hardware and video encoders in their card. Now this is back at the RTX launch, but, you know, saying, okay, you can get a 2060 in your laptop and now it can game and stream on the same GPU and having a product, a Turing class product on the market that doesn't even have that capability of any kind. That's, um, that's weird. All right. Well, that's the, uh, GTX 1650, at least in this case, it's the MSI uh, version of that card, the Gaming X. Uh, So uh, check out the review for all the charts to see how it stacks up. And uh, yeah, I think the the conclusion is there are some cases where you may want to look at this, but there's a lot of really good options in that price range that will probably suit you better. And real quick, I was just going to add, there will be a second look at this coming up in the next week or so, because I got an EVGA card, which is at a lower price point. So I'm going to try overclocking. I didn't have a chance to overclock with this card. So I'll see if maybe with that card plus overclocking, if it becomes a more compelling story at a lower price point. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we will revisit this card. All right. Very good. Uh, let's move on to the next review. This one's, uh, this one's for me. Uh, this is a, uh, a couple of gaming mice that course here kind of uh, surprisingly released, I guess last, uh, last week. I'm losing track of time. Yeah. I think it was last week. Uh, the 25th. Yeah. So this is, and these, these, there are two new gaming mice, but they're basically new versions of existing products. There's the Iron Claw RGB Wireless, which is a wireless version of their Iron Claw that they released at CES this year. And then there's the Corsair Glaive RGB Pro, which is the Pro upgrade of the Glaive RGB mouse. It's a wired mouse that they released, I believe, in 2016 or maybe 2017. It's been on the market for a couple of years. We took a look at both mice. They sent them, sent them out for us to, to review. Uh, the thing about the, we'll start with the Iron Claw. I really liked the Iron Claw that I tried at CES when the wired version launched. It's a very comfortable mouse. And this is going to be a personal preference thing. They, they say it's for palm grippers. So it's got this very large hump that just rests into your palm and feels comfortable. At least again, for me, you may not, you know, you may differ if you like to use more of a fingertip kind of grip on the mouse. But for, for me, I, I liked it. It was comfortable. It was the right weight. It had the buttons I needed in the right places. And this is a wireless version of that. And I initially was very excited, but then I saw that they changed it a bit. So if we're looking at the mouse here, if you're looking at the video version, they've added an additional button above the forward and back buttons. And I'm just realizing the screen capture software doesn't capture my mouse here. So uh, you'll see there's there's the forward and back buttons above the textured part of the m- mouse, and they added a third button on top of that, and then they added two additional buttons flanking or kind of right off the, the left edge of the left click uh, button, the mount, left mouse click button in the front. And all three of these buttons, it's good to have three additional buttons, but they're all very poorly placed, I think. They're the the that button to the t- on top of the front and back buttons you have to really contort your thumb to hit it. And if you're not contorting your thumb, then you sometimes your palm will kind of grab it and inadvertently click it. And then those two buttons in the front, uh, right off of the left click button, it's the same thing. Your index finger, at least again, the way I hold the mouse, my index finger rubs up against them, but not in a way where it's comfortable to lift the finger and push them. And what happened was during my testing, I ended up just inadvertently leaning my finger against them and pushing them. So I ended up having to disable the buttons in the IQ software, which you you can do. You can tell it not to do anything. 
Uh, but that just seems like a waste. And then you still kind of got this annoying little thing like rubbing against your finger. So it, it just, it it was kind of a disappointment. Uh, in terms of battery life too, they think they promised up to, uh, uh, let's see, uh, what well, depends on the mode. So it, it can do their Slipstream 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless. It can do Bluetooth or it can do wired. And so, and then with, with or without RGB, with Slipstream and uh, no RGB, they say up to 24 hours and up to 50 hours with Bluetooth. We didn't get a chance to really put Bluetooth, like the Bluetooth with no RGB, it lasts. You know, we went days and it still didn't, hadn't died. With Slipstream though, we only got about 10 hours. So, I mean, which again, that's that's fine for a gaming mouse with RGBs in it, particularly, because a few years ago that was unheard of. But compared to like a productivity mouse, um, like a Logitech MX Master, which is another mouse I use re uh, frequently, that's that's a pretty short running time. So something to consider there. And then if we look at the Glaive, uh, the Glaive is their sort of customizable mouse. And it's got these grips. It comes with three grips that you can replace on the left side, each one kind of jutting out further. The The one that it comes attached to in the box is very close to the, the body of the mouse. And then there's the middle one that kind of gives you a little bit more to grip with your thumb. And then the, the biggest one kind of actually curves down, runs along the desk surface, and you, you set your, your thumb right down in it. And it's, you know... You're, you're, there's a good chance you're going to find one of these grips that works for you. But once you find it, you're not going to switch. At least that's my view is you're probably not going to be switching. It's designed because they're, they're magnetically attached, these grips. It's designed to kind of switch based on game style or how you're feeling or whatever. But I, I just didn't, over several days using this, I, I just I found one that I liked and it, I didn't want to switch it. And uh, so now you've got this thing that's magnetically attached, which it's not going to fall off as you're using it. But if you put it in your bag or if, if it you know falls to the floor or something, it's, it could fall off. So you've got this semi-attached grip that you're probably not going to change. And, you know, so that's that's an interesting design element. And that's not unique to this to this mouse, uh, but uh, or I'm sorry, to this model. This was on the original Glaive, uh, but it's, it's just something to be be aware of if you haven't used this before. But in terms of styling, it's got RGBs. It's got a nice side RGB as well as uh, five uh, preset DPI uh, switches, so you can you can program different DPI levels for different uh, scenarios and different gameplays, uh, different gameplay types. It's overall uh, a, a fine mouse, and then that's really what I settled on for both of these. They're okay. They're so I gave them silver awards for both. The uh, let's see if I can find the prices here to remind me. The Iron Claw Wireless has a list price of eighty. Dollars and the Glaive RGB Pro again. That's a wired mouse. Has a list price of seventy. Uh, street prices are lower already, so check check for that. But if you know, for me personally, I really like that Iron Claw, but I would stick with the wired version. I think it's more comfortable. I think it, it that the the battery battery life isn't sufficient to uh, justify the uh, you know the the extra cost and having to worry about uh, or you know having to worry about recharging it and stuff just just for the benefit of that that cordless experience. So. Check those out. That's again the uh, the Glaive RGB Pro and the Iron Claw RGB Wireless. Those are available now from Corsair. Is that an induction mouse pad I see behind you, Jim? Uh, that is the Logitech PowerPlay, which has been out for a while. I reviewed it for PC Pro like two years ago when it first launched, and then I didn't have one because I don't know if Ryan sent it back or he has it somewhere, but I didn't get it when the site assets came over. So. I got another one, um, and that's that's if you don't recall, that's the yeah. It's, it's an, the whole surface of the pad is an inductive charger, and there's specific mice that Logitech makes that um, charge with it. And as long as you have that mouse on the pad, it's, it's it'll never run out of battery. Um, have Have you put a metal cup of coffee on the on the pad? Uh, I mean, I haven't tried to intentionally break it, but it's it's. They, well, they no, talked I mean, about it's, it's going to be induction. Will it, will it keep it warm? No, it, there's safety features built in to limit uh, current and all that. And they said the only danger, or not the danger, but the only thing to be aware of when you have metal objects on it is that it, it hinders the ability to charge what you want to charge. So your oh. mouse will not receive a full charge if you put your car keys or a, you know, a, a, a metal mug or something on it. Um, so, but there's could no... You harvest, could you harvest the charging coil from an old phone? attach it to the bottom of a metal coffee mug and use it to heat your coffee or keep your hot coffee warm. <laughs> I, you know, it's, I mean, if you haven't tested that, it's really not a complete review. It's USB powered. 
So we'll say that, you know, that, that it plugs into a USB type A port on your okay. computer. So there's probably a, a limit to the total draw. I'm going to, I'm going to look at Amazon to maintain for a USB temperature coffee warmer. Yes. It, 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 you know, it could be, uh, it, it could, uh, we'll have to look that's, that's a project that is outside of my area of expertise, but I'm sure we can find somebody, maybe Alan, if we can get him back here, he's got, Scott it. has one of those too. He just got one. The mm-hmm. That's right. Yes. Pad, so I'll have to. We'll so stack the two on top of each other. Yeah. Well, I got to go with the one be more powerful and serial. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Raid. Uh, but, uh, let's let's uh, let's move on with the reviews. We've got another review. This one is from Sebastian, and this is um, uh, a product that uh, launched uh, earlier this month, and it's mm-hmm. uh, Intel's attempt to further push Optane into all parts of our lives. Yes. Well. Yeah. The the full title is a mouthful it's intel optane memory h10 with solid state storage what you're looking at is two drives in one and it's interesting because it's a pcie gen 3 by 4 but it's actually two different by two devices sharing one pcb and if you have a compatible system such as the whiskey lake laptop that we were sent to review this with it actually detects it as two completely separate devices so this is a bifurcated device and you have to have a motherboard that understands that there were some bios updates going out for different boards to add support for this even though it's not a shipping retail product at all it's only at least so far going to be available in oem small form factors such as laptop and mini pc or all-in-one computer and it's so it's a way of getting you that optane module and a qlc ssd like a mainstream kind of mid-range ssd together on one little m.2 device that'll fit in any small form factor like thin and light laptops as long as it can accept an m.2 card so from a technical standpoint this is fascinating and i had to go back and i was trying to read up on some of alan's coverage from the past like the 2017 review he had of the 32 gigabyte optane module which is what this contains we got the 512 gigabyte module with our laptop to test so Everything that he talked about in the past, like our previous articles, which I linked to, it talks about the benefits of Optane, what it can do with its incredibly low latency, just a ridiculously fast response time compared to NAND, is absolutely true with this. What's interesting about it is because it's two different devices, so you're essentially getting the Optane module and your SSD together, you have to use Intel software, either the Optane specific software or the Intel SSD toolbox to create a virtual, like a, a cache. It's physically using the Optane module as cache, but then you can do things like manually pin certain things to the Optane cache, which is built into the right click context menu in Windows when this is installed, or it, you can just let it intelligently decide. And there's a built in uh, schedule. Uh, scheduled maintenance kind of it runs its own optimization Uh, the default was like 2 a.m you can manually run it yourself in the task scheduler if you want to but it's just kind of interesting as you go along you can just use your laptop like a normal laptop and it will eventually intelligently cache things that you use on a regular basis and create much lower access times for those files what was interesting is and basically the only real way to test this with any like significant gains over say a fast like nvme drive instead of doing a bunch of synthetic tests or do file copies and and look at uh average like uh you know transfer speeds and that sort of thing i just basically used it for a couple of weeks as a a, my primary laptop and ran some like low-tech stopwatch tests which is something that i i got from alan this is something that he did the last time he reviewed optane to try to get a picture of what this actually is doing on a system and where this really excels is if you have anything going on in the background. Say you have a download going, you're like downloading a Steam game or or something, and you, you're copying a file over from an external drive or what have you, and you go to open up something else. So just typical multitasking behavior that involves disk usage. And Optane is, is very, very good at providing you good access times, even with background activity. But because this is a hybrid, because this is essentially a form of RAID, you have two different devices that are sort of, there's like an intelligent caching going on and it can use both the NAND and the Optane. It it really excels at opening up applications or doing other work while something's going on in the background. As I attempt to say this in a less long-winded way, but if you look at the the graph, I did a couple of uh, different file 
tests where I was opening like a large Excel file or something while something was copying in the background. There's a huge difference between the H10 with Optane enabled, without it enabled, and then even going to a really fast drive like the Western Digital uh, SN750, which is even a, a larger drive, is a one terabyte drive, so it has an advantage there. That was still lagging quite a ways behind with things like opening up a game or opening up a large GIMP project, like an image file, opening up a large Excel file. So it's it's impressive for multitasking, especially. And then I took it to the one synthetic thing that I ran was PC Mark 10. I just ran the full suite. And you can see that with Optane enabled the same laptop, I just swapped the drives between the laptops and uh, had cloned the Windows install. It is notably faster. If you look at the overall score, it was a little bit higher. It was 30 points higher with the Optane drive versus Intel 760p SSD. And then the biggest gain was from the essentials tests. And what's interesting about essentials is, and there's subcategories for all of these, essentials includes the app startup time score. So you were getting significantly better, you know, lower latency, faster app startups, just in general usage. And this is, uh, these results on the chart are actually average from three different completely separate runs with like clean reboots and everything in between. So it's a pretty good, indication of the fact that this can provide you better overall speed it's just you can't just throw any test at this and see huge gains you're not going to do a straight file copy and see you know it's sustaining these really really fast speeds this is more about low latency quality of service low q depths the kind of stuff that i can't even begin to approach the level of expertise that alan used to have on this podcast but while i am not a storage editor it was interesting to test this out and to see that there really is a real world difference. And what I noticed was just a snap your overall response to things that I frequently did. Windows boot times are very good. It doesn't feel that much different than a fast NVMe drive, honestly. But what's interesting about it is they're combining a slow QLC drive with this Optane cache and basically providing the experience of a really fast SSD. It I don't know if this is like a stopgap type product or if this is like a future category that Intel will really pursue. But the cost of it is kind of an unknown right now too, because this is only going to be sold through OEMs. And laptop pricing, from what we've been able to figure out, we're going to see laptops starting at around $800 with the 256 gig version of this. So I don't know. If, if you're looking at a thin and light, 800 is not expensive for this category. And if you're looking at, or, you know, that's 800 to 1000 maybe $1,200 price range, and you're probably expecting to see around a 512 gigabyte SSD, this would be an interesting alternative. And it does give you some capabilities you just can't get from regular drive, especially for like, you know, background drive activity, but still getting a responsive OS experience. Yeah, interesting. An interesting uh, product. I wish we did have, you know, like DIY aftermarket pricing just to see how this you know, shaped up uh, compared to just, you know, going all out with a set nine, uh, 970 Evo Plus or something. Yeah, the, the jump in pricing from one capacity to the other is the only way that I could even estimate it. And the smallest jump I saw was about 150 bucks when you go from 256 to 512. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's somewhere in that 150 range, the price difference, which would, to me, I would estimate it being like a $300 product, but I have no idea. And this is not that's that's all wrapped up in whatever the OEM is is actually getting it for, what kind of margins they have for the product. So yeah. there's not really anybody to know. I haven't well, the, seen a price on this actual laptop that we got in yet either to even try to estimate it. Go ahead, Josh. It's nice to see y'all. I don't know what happened. My internet was fine. Oh, were you frozen? I thought you were just really, really contemplative for a while. No, I, I was, I was, I was totally disconnected from you guys. So oh. I felt so far away, and then Welcome finally you just Josh, came back. Josh, tell magically. me what you think. Tell me what you think about the uh, test platform. This is the HP Spectre X three sixty thirteen T. It's like a, it's like a plum color. Uh huh. If that even shows up with gold, like a rose gold. Mm -hmm. I mean. What do you think about it? It's kind that? of sharp looking for people who like it, but I don't know. Yeah. What's your personal it's very, preference? It's very gold and plum. That's all I've got. That's it. All right. Hey, at least they're reaching out and doing something different. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, real, real quick, because I always like to, to nip these in the bud whenever I see them. There's a, a question in the chat. Is Ryan still involved like behind the scenes with PC Per? No. Uh, he immediately stepped down uh, from control once he was hired by Intel, and that was in November, I think, of last year. And then the site officially sold. He got divested all ownership January 1st, but had no editorial involvement between those those times. So uh, it's fun. You know, it, people people only stop by occasionally, it seems, huh? I wonder how long this is going to go on if we keep getting people coming in going, hey, what, who's... All right, uh, let's move on to the news. Uh, some uh, some surprising announcements, I guess. I mean, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, AMD celebrating its 50th anniversary, uh, just like Intel, or sort of like Intel did last year with the anniversary edition 8086, uh, decided to get in on the special edition hardware game. And they've launched the 50th anniversary limited edition gold series Ryzen and Radeon 7 products. What do you guys think about this? Yes. What do you think about an all red Radeon 7? It's pretty sexy. That's that's there is I something mean, wrong with you. No, in the right it, but with the right with color red. scheme. What's that? It should have been like white, maybe red with a white Radeon logo. Okay, so, well I I would but, say between this and the default Radeon 7 scheme color scheme, I do prefer the default. I like that silver um and here he's going to he's going to get it for us. He's got it right within I arm's to have reach. It right here. You know, now, it's, the, one of the great things about this design was that if, if it focuses was that you had this nice contrast on the top. It's like a little kind of like a dice almost that lights up red. And then you had the Radeon logo, which lights up red, which is, you know, stands out against this nice, like anodized aluminum shroud and backplate. But it's, it's an aesthetic choice. If you're team red and you want a red graphics card, it's the same price. It's the same performance. So I, I'm yep. happy to see that they came out with it and they didn't upcharge for it at all. If you want a limited edition red one, and some free stuff. I think the, the advantage of this over the standard one is what, like, uh, you also get a T-shirt because you're getting the uh, same and free a games signed you get. thingy thing, a sticker. Well, like, okay. Well, the maybe. well, the yeah, the processor and a T-shirt uh, has a signature on it. I think it's just like a laser signature, but laser edge, baby. Yeah, and that I'm is important to know. Affect uh, thermal performance. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, even though. Um, <laughs> The, the end result was not ideal for the uh, 8086K uh, anniversary edition Intel processor last year. Theoretically, it was a, it was a different performance level. It was supposed to hit 5 gigahertz uh, you know, out of the box. As Ken saw when we tested it, 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 it didn't quite get there. Uh, it took some, some massaging to get there. These products are, are aesthetic differences only. So it's the They're same bog the standard performance. Yep. So you get you get and the you bad get thing that. is. Go ahead. And you no, get special oh, commemorative packaging too. You do. Go ahead, Josh. But uh, you can get. Uh, I think it was on sale. The regular twenty seven hundred X was two seventy nine, and you still got the two free games with it. I think they've jumped mm -hmm. that up to like two ninety two, but still for you know forty bucks, you're getting a t shirt and a sticker and. A pretty package and that laser etch signature. And everyone knows that red ones go faster. But even the positive of these is is you know that these have been manufactured pretty recently because it's got a nineteen uh, twenty nineteen uh, week thirteen stamp on there, and and some of the others that I've seen have you know week fourteen. So you know maybe in for the theory, uneducated among gonna, us, what does that mean? That's when they're actually fabricated. So, right, the initial I mean, fabrication possibly better overclocking potential, or potentially better overclocking because it's a you know it's it's a more optimized process. They've worked out a lot of kinks from the initial twenty seven hundred X production, and and uh, you know in theory you should be slightly better month after month after month. By a small amount, but you'd think that after a year that um, you know they would they would have enough improvements in there that you know you'd probably get a little bit better performance and overclocking from this one than if you bought the 2700x last April or May or whenever it came out. Yeah. Isn't it too close to the launch of Zen 2 to really get excited about a special edition 2700x for $329? 
It's a good question. Why, you got something else to be good. excited about? I know. Uh, well, the red Radeon 7, it's the same price. It's the okay. exact same GPU you can get. It's the top of the line AMD. G- I like that. I, I thought that was cool. Give people a choice in shroud color and some free stuff. And then the other part of this announcement was that they were going to be partnering with some, like today, I believe, was actually, I think it was the first, was Best Buy. May 1st is their 50th. Yeah, they were having a little celebration with like discounts on different AMD products. And that's going to be kind of carrying on through, I think, the 8th. Uh, various retailers and e-tailers, they said, are going to have some discounts out there. So there's there's some good stuff for consumers. It says, yeah, running through June 8th. So you got another month. Which will be plenty of time to see what Lisa Sue talks about at Computex. And then you can decide. Yeah. All right. Well, they uh, said second half of the year for new CPUs, Q3. <laughs> so you still got a couple of months left. That's true. Uh, yeah, right. she, yeah she's, she'll announce, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect a launch uh, right then at the end of May or early June. So, all right, uh, let's, uh, let's keep rolling on with the news. Don't want to go. I, I said this was going to be a short show. We've already broken an hour, at least on the recording. Jeremy found some interesting news for us. Windows Media Center lives, sort of? Sort of. It, the original person who, or one of the original team members uh, from Microsoft, Charlie Owen, posted the entire SDK to GitHub. So you can now get your hands on it, which doesn't mean that it immediately works and fire up and away you go, ha, ha, ha. But it does mean that there are going to be people working to build the equivalent of what it used to be. And for some, that is a really good thing because for instance, up here in Canada, cord cutting can be frustrating because you lose like 99% of your local programming. Uh, whereas in the States, some of them do carry local programming when you cord cut and go to one of those uh, online providers. In this case, I mean, even the satellite, unless you're really lucky, you're not getting uh, anything good from your antenna or not, it's not satellite, but antenna. So cord cutting means, you know, just keeping a minimal uh, thing around. And so we miss Windows Media Center where, you know, screw having the digital cable box. I just want it running straight into my TV. If I want to record it, I've got a remote with a button on it and away I go. If I wanted time to save stuff later on, I'm not buying a PVR with anyone actually still does that anymore. I'm just sticking it on my terabyte hard drive and away I go. So, I mean, I honestly miss this program. It was very handy and it fills something that my Roku doesn't, that the Plex doesn't, uh, and that my antenna doesn't. So, you know, it's really nice to know that in the next couple of months, we're going to see Windows Media Center in probably dozens of different forms, each one with a different wrapper or a different setup, but it's there on GitHub. And hey, if you want, why not just go play with it? See if you can figure out how it works and do it. Yeah, I remember when when this was the thing that the, the big the big benefit of Media Center was there were lots of software options, Linux based ones, and on the Mac there was uh, Elgato had something I think it was called ITV, but none of them worked with cable card, and Windows Media Center was like the only one for years that was licensed to work Absolutely. with cable card standard. And so if you wanted your cable, this was before the streaming services. Uh, you wanted your cable being able to record and watch it through your your PC and your your other digital devices. This was the way to go. And I I, I had Windows Media Center. I think I had the, I got the Windows XP Special Edition with Media Center back in 05, I guess what that would have been. And I think Alan, our beloved Alan, still runs this. Uh, last time we were talking about, I mean, he, oh, he's kind of gone on, on the Windows flex XP? train. No, uh, not after he, what he went through to get those cable cards, I mm-hmm. don't doubt he's still running it. Yeah. That was the other thing. Like getting a cable card from your cable company was not easy. Uh, yeah. Uh things are better these days, but there is, as Jeremy said, there's still a lot of a lot of uh opportunity to use something like this. So we're interested to see where this goes. So uh check out the uh the GitHub uh repository for that and uh, see if you wanna Roll up your sleeves and dig in and see what you can find and and contribute there. All right. uh, Another story kind of uh, touching back in time here. Something about filthy balls, mouse balls. You know it. You lived it. Filthy, filthy mouse balls and sitting there trying to pry the gunk and dirt that accumulated in them at least once a week or so, depending on how clean your house was. Well, and in, then in one day, fairness, it was really as it was as much the shaft as it was the balls. True. That's true. It you had to get in there and balls. 
and pick it off the shaft because it scraped kind of those rollers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You you absolutely had to go balls deep to get all the way to the shaft. Yes, but once you've gotten that far, it wasn't that hard. And no, I, are you happy now? Once you got going, does this make you feel good? <laughs> are you disappointed? Well, in what made me? That? F- <laughs> what made me feel good was twenty years ago, at when back in the days when uh, what was it CES or no? This was Computex. Which was it? No, it was CS. Comdex. Well, actually, when they went to CS. Yeah. There you go. When they announced something, it actually did come out r- relatively soon afterwards. And what it was was that thing right there, the IntelliMouse Explorer from Microsoft. And when you flipped it over, there was a completely sealed enclosure with just this little tiny hole in it and an optical sensor, which, you know, might have involved a Q tip occasionally, but didn't involve digging around on the balls in the shaft. And it was amazing. And it came out at 80 to 100 bucks, depending on where you were, which was affordable for someone who was sick and tired of doing it and, you know, used their mice a lot. Whereas before, you had to give Sun about three grand and you get a nice laser mouse and a fancy mouse pad and a very large system that you didn't really know what to do with, but you had to get the system to get the mouse and the mouse pad. And back then, those mouse pads were specifically designed, very reflective, shiny things with patterns in them. And even if it was slightly off of true, your mouse would have some interesting side effects. So this thing, boom, out of nowhere, it's a mouse. It, it's got hundreds of DPI. Because <laughs> trying to explain this to a kid now, we're like, but no, it's like got 15,000 DPI. Like, no, no, maybe 1,500 on a good day but you don't understand the difference between it and the ball. Yeah. Man, those, those Corsair <laughs> mice we talked about earlier, they have PixArt sensors with 18,000 maximum DPI. Yeah, if someone had come and told me that 20 years ago, I would just, just laughed my ass off at them and then gone back to my Intel Mouse Explorer. And those things were bulletproof and just worked and affordable. And it really, really changed, you know, the thing you interface with your computer the most, you know, people say it's the GPU or the CPU or the monitor. It's your mouse and keyboard that you're really fondling most of the time. So it made a big change. And so I had to look it up six years from now, we will can have another celebration. Apple introduced the first mouse with two buttons for their systems. Was it two buttons or was it just that it had a right click functionality? Well, you had a right click function. Right. It was it just still one giant button. Yeah. Yeah. But there were two functions that you could do. Wow. Well, it see, took them a while. That after Jobs left, that was so anti Jobs. No, that was that buttons. was when he was back. That, that oh, was after his return. Yeah, that's when he came back after yeah. he left. That horrible, horrible white plastic mouse. Uh, yeah, like one, the one, the sided, one, if you rocked it on one side, it was a right click, but you had to assign it because out of the box, it only had one button enabled in OS 10 always. It, it, it did. Well, didn't it want did to default. scare the Apple people. Right. Cause we were used to yeah. hitting control. If you wanted a right click, you hold down the control key. But the thing about that mouse was it was completely just like the Apple TV remotes today. It was completely symmetrical. And so you couldn't tell by, by feel if it was the right side up. And I was working at Apple in these days, and we had elderly customers yelling at us and ca- calling us, saying the mouse is going backwards because they had the mouse upside <laughs> down, and they're moving up with the cursor, and the cursor's going down because they didn't realize it was upside down. So uh, because the mouse tail is at the bottom. Your chair around. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, and that took a while to figure because they're they're trying to explain what's happening. We don't understand. Uh, so Johnny Ives, a world class award winning design, at work yet again. But, but at least it wasn't a puck this time. But at least the puck Ooh, had a the cord, so you knew mouse? which way was up. Oh, you're talking about the wireless one, right? Okay. Yeah, the wireless ma- uh, wireless. magic mouse. Yep. Yeah. All right. Or was it the Until Disney asked them the not to say mouse. that yeah. anymore. The, mag- yeah. the yeah. magic was the glass top. The mighty mouse was the original wireless. I thought anyway. Okay, sure, maybe. I, my I my point is the roller, the actual like scroll scrolling. It wasn't a scroll wheel. It was a scroll ball on that mouse was just as bad as an old ball mouse because it would get dirty, but then there was no easy way to access it. 
So you'd have the, the worst, most inconsistent scrolling experience with those things. Even though it was a laser mouse, it was still that manual ball for scrolling. Do you remember this? And yeah, it would. And it to this day, skinny. Apple is still designing poor interfaces. What? Except now there's keyboards. At least the if, top of it now is just glass. So it's like a touch for scroll, yeah. which is fine. But if it gets sturdy, but, just buy a new one. Yes. But but now it charges from the bottom and you can't plug it in while you're using it. So it's yes. every step of the way they have screwed up the mouse since the very beginning. Yep. There's a, a subreddit called asshole design that you should investigate to, yes. to uh, find other examples of, of similar choices. Um, all right, let's um, continue on with the news here. We've got some, some processor news, uh, some leaks uh, from Intel's uh, camp this week. Comet Lake CPUs coming out, and uh, they've got some unusual names. Uh, Ten thousand series, to be exact. We're we're used to four digits, and uh, based on these leaks, and and they're from credible sources like our friend uh, Appysack. There, mm -hmm. it looks like we're going to have you know the Core i5 1021U. You know, so you'll have five digits in your CPU name. What do you guys think about this? They're not into small things. Thanks. They don't want to do 10 nanometer. They don't want to do short names. Yes. <laughs> Haven't they already, already done three number skewed? So, I mean, what are you going to do? Yeah. Go backwards? Yeah. No. Yeah. And then the Halo Mera it was just three numbers. It had the 960. That's and the right. 20, yeah. of course. And we went yeah. to four digits with now Sandy Bridge. Five. Yes. Well, they I do like the, video, yeah, the, the number generation. Problem. One at a time, gentlemen. I have like you were saying with the uh, the SSD and, and what its full name is there. Well, Optane SSD. The full name is ridiculous. Oh, right? Yeah. So uh, like, Intel Optane ninth generation core series Optane Core i five one hundred and two one U. Yep. Well, they don't want you to it's buy the Acer, that the Acer approach. Mm -hmm. Just yes. When in doubt, add more digits and letters. I loved yep. looking at. Uh, it was actually a non tech. I think last week when. Intel's uh, new SKUs all went out, and we had like all the, the breakdown between the i9s and the i7s and the i5s and that sort of thing. Jim wrote a beautiful article on it. Uh, Ian trying to that. one up you, Jim. Oh, he did. He did this little chart where he showed you all of the different, like the how to read an Intel processor number basically, and what all the different letters mean, like appending the name. And we should I should link this because. You could really come up with something special by going like all out with a five character processor number with the prefix and then the suffix adding like the power level and whether or not it has graphics on board or not. Like the new K, not K. What is the one without graphics? There's a, a letter code for, for no Eight. graphics. Oh, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. But yeah, there, there's Absolutely options. Failed. There's options. But all right, well, we'll we'll uh, we'll keep an eye out for for what happens with the the next gen naming and see just how many digits they want to go. I mean, branding's always an issue across the decades. I mean, uh, you know what, GeForce uh, four forty six hundred, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're at the GTX two thousand series, so. When are things going to get confusing for them? Yeah. Okay, here we go. K is overclockable, of course. We know that. It's unlocked. KF is overclockable, but no integrated GPU. Mm -hmm. No suffix means standard CPU, 54 to 65 watt TDP range with integrated graphics. F means no integrated graphics. T is low power, 35 watt TDP. The current breakdown is Core i9s are eight cores hyper-threaded. Core i7s, eight cores no hyper threading. Mm -hmm. Interesting switch there. Core i5, six cores, no HT. Core i3, four cores, no HT. Pentium Gold, two cores with hyper threading. And Celeron is two cores, no hyper threading. And now they're going to throw into this mix <laughs> a five digit CPU number. And here we were complaining about the server skews last week. <laughs> yeah. You know what they say? You know what they say? Never get into a fight with a CPU company. Who buys ink by the barrel? Wow, mm -hmm. because sure. they need that much ink to do their freaking names. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, the good news is for most customers, it's pretty clear. Like the enthusiasts, they're going to go for the high high end parts, and then everyone else, they're not buying a CPU; they're buying a system at a performance level that their rep, you know, their vendor has sold them on. So, you know, I think what this probably won't. You got? Yeah, I've 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 got a Via. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's almost a collector's item. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do want to point one out five feet away from me, but anyway, moving of on. Of course you do. Of course you do. Um, I do want to point out too, uh, cause we, we, we do talk over each other just for, again, to reiterate, uh, we have a slight delay amongst our own feed, not only talking to the chat where we have like a nice 20 second delay, we've got like a second and a half delay talking to each other. So that sometimes leads to what appears to be rudeness. And in some cases may be genuine rudeness, but Probably, in my case, it's almost always rudeness. Uh, fair enough, but but, but just but, now when I intentionally talked over you. Yes, exactly, and, and then talked uh, over you again. But you know the thing is, I can just shut off your audio. So now he's muted. Isn't that beautiful? We can replace you with a dial tone. Uh huh. All right, you're back. Um, so forgive us if we do occasionally stumble over each other. Uh, there is that the the realities of remote production work. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, continue on with the news here. Turning uh, this time to AMD leaks and rumors, as we talked about earlier, we've got Zen 2 coming out in the X500 uh, chipset. Uh, Tim found, uh, you know, this is not the first rumor along these lines, but additional uh, rumors are coming out about engineering samples that are reaching AMD's board partners and saying that these engineering samples, which generally start, you know, it's hard to, you can't, I don't want to make generalizations, but if we have to, they're, they're going to be lower frequency. They're not going to be quite optimized yet. These are the early parts that get to the board manufacturers to start looking at compatibility and, and performance tweaking and all that. And according to these rumors, those engineering samples, which again are not optimized, are hitting 4.5 gigahertz at 8, eight core 16 threads. And uh, they're saying that in terms of just IPC, looking at generation over generation, it's a 15% gain. So that would be an interesting, if that's, if that's true, uh, and there's further room for improvement, which again, may not be true. We don't know, but in, in, in the past with most processors, you do have a little bit of tweaking uh, between those engineering samples and the final product. This could be, uh, you know, again, further uh, evidence that AMD has got something big up their sleeves here coming up. What do you, what do you think, Josh? Well, uh, I kind of, think back to yesteryear when the uh the athlon the original k7 was released sharky sharky extreme got a hold of an engineering sample and they did all kinds of benchmarks and tests and it was on a pre-production fic sd11 board i think and uh the results were awful for like a 450 megahertz part i mean it just it was slower than a k6 and definitely slower than the pentium 3 and then uh, the real things finally hit the the scene, and they were they were a step above everything that AMD had done beforehand. Now I don't think it's going to be this extreme. I think that what they're probably getting in engineering samples is getting pretty close to what we will see in uh, the full uh, you know the full release, because back then those engineering samples they ran hot, they pulled as much power as as what would eventually be you know released and uh plus they were really worried about intel back in those days and so the engineering samples probably were slightly disabled as compared to what was finally reaching but i think in this case i mean they're not as their cloak and dagger goes into other areas um especially when you're talking about development five to six years out on a lot of these products and so, you know, they're, they're moving and talking more about that development in different ways than, than, you know, what may actually show up in, in, you know, at release. But yeah, I think that it, we're probably real near final products. Now, six months ago with the first things back from the fab, probably not so much, but now pretty comfortable because they, they do need to hit those TDPs and the power draw and being able to optimize the BIOS and firmware and UEFI stuff. So yeah, I think that uh, we're pretty close. Yeah. And that would uh, support the additional part of this rumor, which is that the Ryzen 3000 processors and Navi and that 570 chipset uh, would be launching in July. 
and then B550 coming two months later, they say. So that is pretty close. And I Getting just there. love the fact that I can look at that third gen Threadripper and say, geez, I could probably just upgrade to that without changing anything else. That will be a big Except factor. A yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, the, the, the upgradability amongst uh, these platforms the last few years is, is going to be a big factor for moving chips, I think. But I know Jeremy will still want to upgrade just for more RGBs. I mean, he's how many RGBs powered RGBs? Mm. PCIe 4.0 RGBs. RGBs. It'll yeah. it'll be a new color, octarine or something. Yeah, they'll I mean, have new RGBs on the uh, on the CPU substrate, so that you'll get this ooh. nice glow underneath the heatsink. Why not underglow? You know, uh, I've I've heard we've that been storage... stuck at sixteen point. We've been stuck at sixteen point seven million colors for a while now, and I, I think it's time for somebody to come out with true 32-bit rgb i want to see that at ces next year mm. okay with optional upgraded eyeballs yeah the human eye can only oh. see <laughs> so many million colors well i, I can know. see a lot of green well, they'll, yeah they'll, they'll, yeah you'll need it you, but the active glasses that will ship with these which are only ah. 180 dollars a pair will really change the experience oh wait a minute 3d rg synesthesia Taste you have the RGB NAND. Okay. Holographic. Okay. I want holographics on my motherboard. All right. Let's uh, let's just keep going. Let's wrap this up. Um, we've got a couple more news stories, and then we'll get into the picks of the week. Uh, real quick, Intel, back at their data-centric event in March. No, it was April, April 2nd. Uh, they had a bunch of products that they launched. We talked about them. The one product that didn't have any details, like in terms of like when it was going to be out, was this. This is the Intel... Optane SSD DC D4800X. It's an enterprise grade Optane based SSD. And it's, uh, you may find that the product number is familiar and that's because there's the P4800X, which has been out for about 18 months now. I think Alan reviewed it for us uh, before he left. And uh, this is pretty much the same in terms of performance characteristics at a base level, but it's got two independent NVMe controllers in it. So you connect two separate storage controllers to the two ports on this drive. And that gives you redundancy. So you can, if, if, if one fails, your, your data is not going to go down. Or if you have to do an upgrade, you don't have to take the system offline to do the upgrade. You upgrade one side of the controller and then bring it back up and then upgrade the other. The, the disadvantage though, is that they have to, just like with, uh, with what Sebastian was talking about with Optane H10, the, this product overall has a by four PCIe 3.0 interface. And so because there's two controllers, they have to split that by four. So each controller only gets by two. So it's not going to be as performant as the, you know, some of the other products in this category that are, are tuned for speed, but this is the product you choose when you want redundancy over, over performance. No exact pricing yet. Uh, they will be shipping first in Dell's all flash high-end PowerMax storage servers. But if we look at the, uh, like I said, the P4800, the single port versions, uh, the 375 gig model is a thousand dollars, one thousand seventy five dollars, and the 750 gig model is twenty two hundred. So expect uh, more than that, I would imagine. Probably not a huge amount more, but but uh, clearly more at, at each storage tier in terms of price. So if you're in the enterprise looking for Optane storage, this is the first time that Optane is available in this redundant design. Check that out. And uh, finally. This was uh, teased, I think, last month, and, and the details finally came out uh, this week, and then the pre-order started. This is the latest tethered VR headset from Valve, the Valve Index VR. Did you guys get a chance to look at this? Uh, the, I guess the pre-orders launched this afternoon, uh, but they had some details up as of uh, this morning. It didn't come with Half-Life 3, so I rage quit. Well, not yet. So part of this, so let's real quick, let's run down the specs. This is a high-end headset. The whole kit with the headset, the controllers, and the sensors is going to be $1,000, but you can buy the headset alone for 400 or 500 I think. Or was it 400 500 for the headset. 499 Yeah, so 500 for just the headset, 280 for the controllers, which are new and have better sensors for all finger, like it measures all the movement of all fingers. It uh, doesn't work perfectly, some of the early reviews said, but but uh, better controllers, uh, so you can mix and match. You can 
it's compatible with your existing Vive hardware. So you could just like upgrade the headset, but keep your old controllers and sensors. Um, and it's going to be compatible, of course, with all the, the Steam VR software and games. And part of this announcement was Valve saying they've got, quote, a flagship title in, for VR scheduled for later this year. And that's that's all they said. They they didn't go into, is it Half-Life? Is it Portal? Is it, uh, I don't know, what else? Uh, what's their card game? that Paper they're Airplane Simulator. Maybe, yeah. I mean, they, they, they were clear about flagship. So it's probably, it's going to be a, a major intellectual property for them. But we don't know Fortnite? which one. Oh, no, wrong wrong company. Oh, um, okay. I don't know. Tim uh, Sweeney. Starcraft. Not, Steve Valve but, wishes they had for it. Yes. Game Fortress 2 VR. Could be. Who knows? I mean, uh, they literally gave no other information. So all we know is it's coming this year. It'll be compatible with all Steam VR devices. So you don't have to buy this to play it. It'll work with your existing Vive and other Steam VR compatible headsets. You know what it's actually going to be? Half-Life Source VR. Okay. Oh, that would be me. I mean, it, it requires very little coding yep. to get it up yeah. to speed, and you'll get to replay the classic in, in VR. Well, if they do it right, I guess that could be something. I mean... You do remember when they, they, they brought out Half-Life Source? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Well, you know, they had the original Half-Life. Yeah. And then after they developed the Source engine in 2004, they ported Half-Life over to Source, calling it right. Half-Life Half Source. Source. Well, and so they're now porting Half-Life Source to, to VR. Steam VR. Okay, sure. Exactly. Well, Jim, Jim was in high school in his defense. So he doesn't really remember that, Josh. Oh, no. What year was that? Sorry. 2004. Was you probably a senior not... in high school, right? No. no, I was in college when Half-Life initially launched. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, but they got, you got sent high. back a few grades, right? I, I was held back. Really? I was. I was a child, and I my mother said I wasn't doing well. It was kindergarten, so she held me back. That meant I could drive and drink before all my classmates. In kindergarten? Uh, same year, think. yes. So it, was, it, was early, a, yeah. it was a rough and was tumble kindergarten in Western New York. Kindergarten. The 80s were a hell of a time for Buffalo. Um so yeah, so uh, check that out uh, for for Valve. I know the the, the pre orders went up at I think one o'clock Eastern today. They're already pushed back. The full kit I think is pushed to August. It was it's going to ship June twenty eighth was the original date. The full kit's back to August, and then the various components that you can buy individually I think have all uh, been pushed back by this point. But uh, you can uh, head over and, and check that out and see see what you can get and uh, when it'll be available. So let's let's get uh, get this wrapped up. I'm really super tired and kind of losing it. So let's get into the picks of the week. Um, I'll start first. This is a pick that it's when I when I found it, I thought to myself, this is something Alan would have picked at some point in the, the eight years or nine years he was here. Uh, but I couldn't find it. I went kind of searched through the podcast. and I, I, I didn't see it. So if he did pick it, I missed it. Um, but this is called Flashpoint. And if you remember the late 90s and into the early 2000s, Flash games, web-based Flash games were everywhere of all kinds, kids games. Uh, I can play uh, Newgrounds again? It, yes, it, it basically, they, they, what this project does is it goes out and it takes thousands of those games from all the different platforms, adult games, kids games, puzzle games, sports games, uh, idle games. Do they have Spank, spank Your Monkey? They might. I, 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 there's too many to check, but basically... You download this app, it comes pre-packaged with a standalone Flash player, and then you get this interface, and um, I can't run it right now, but if I can play this video, uh, you can kind of see, you get this interface, if you can kind of make that out, it's as big as I can make it without screwing up the capture, but you, you, you've got categories, there's, there's curated lists that people have put together, of like their favorite, you know, the early idle games, when that first became a thing with Flash. Um, and, and uh, multiplayer games and race games. And you search through it. It's got standalone Flash built in, so you don't have to worry about installing it on your system. And then the games play perfectly, at least as far as I've seen. Every game I've tried to play loads perfectly, plays perfectly, right in a self-contained little window, and then you can close it and move on to the, to the next game. So it's uh, a, a super nostalgic kind of experience uh, there's two ways to get it. You can download the base package, which is about 450 megs, 
that gives you the index. And then as you pick games, it'll just download them on demand. Or if you're an archive data hoarder kind of person, you can grab the ultimate package, which is 102 gigabytes, includes all the games built in. <laughs> and then you, if the internet goes down and it's the end of the world, you can hold up with your generator and play flash games. I swear that Alan, until the end of time. Alan did do this once because we laughed yeah. about the whole okay. 102 gig download. Yeah. But it was, it was many, many years back. ago. I think it's gotten bigger. Oh, and because the, yes, this is they're on version 6.0. And so the, the curators of this are are adding to it as they collect more games and fix bugs and things. It's really, um, I mean, don't go crazy and get the 102 gig right off the bat, but check out the, you know, the, the 500 meg on demand downloader, kind of experiment with it. And uh, if you grew up and had internet access at that time, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to have a, a nostalgia trip for sure. So Sebastian, you got your new NVMe benchmark. Yeah, How quick yeah, exactly. can it load one of these games? <laughs> Yep. Well, how how quickly can I transfer the entire library from one NVMe SSD to the other? Absolutely. Uh, 100 all right. gigs? 100, 102 gigs and growing. And that's the compressed size. It it uncompresses when it hits your drive. So you probably need more than that. But, um, oh, just all right, like Jeremy. 10. Right. <laughs> what have you got for us here, Jeremy? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, when I first saw this, I just laughed my ass off because everyone has seen the 3d Benji tugboat, uh, which is how you, it's, it's a rather difficult, but not ridiculously difficult print, um, with a lot of hanging edges and stuff that you got to build up that really shows if you've set your 3d printer up properly or not. And so people of course despise it because they have printed out hundreds of them and spent so much time just staring at the bloody tugboat and then had to adjust it and test it again and again. <laughs> But what was wonderful is that he decided to use this tugboat as a garbage disposal benchmark in that he was looking for a garbage dispenser that or a garbage disposal that would grind up this fine enough that he could now use it uh, to print again because it's ground up fine enough that it's like uh, for the, the PLA, which comes in sort of a powder. And so sure enough, he found one grinds it up perfectly enough that if you're using PLA exclusion, you can now reuse all of your tugboats and have the joy of grinding them up. So it's, it's win-win and good for the environment because you're recycling your plastic. Check the video wow. and it is quite short and kind of amusing. Oh yeah. Does he make the a tugboat lot again? A lot. And again, Does... and again. <laughs> uh. Nice. All right. That's over at uh, Hackaday. So check that out. The links links for all of our picks will be in the show notes uh, in the published version of the podcast. Uh, next up, we've got, uh, I believe, uh, Josh. Yes, you do. Uh, you know, I don't know if you actually want to buy this, but it's an option. If that uh, $699 video card for AMD 50 was a little too much for you, this one's a little bit more affordable. It's, <laughs> it is an RX 590. It's from Sapphire. It's kind of an officially branded AMD 50th anniversary. It's in gold, not red. Ooh. And uh, it's got a DVI port. Ooh. Hot damn. But 240 is it's a little pricey for well, it's a, an it's RX a 590. 590. It, they're yeah. 220 to 240 ish sometimes. Sometimes. All right. And uh, last up, we've got Sebastian with his pick. That's right, and this is also available on Amazon, and I happen to have it right here. This is also the Diamond cool. Select, the uh, TOS communicator. Uh, not much to say about this. You're it a makes nerd. sounds. It has dialogue in the show. I am a nerd, but check it out. Look, look, it's calling me. All right, uh, stand by. What did he say? Spock, said, Spock, Spock here, Captain. Stand by. Oh, okay. He didn't say I, the I, other it, word that kind of rounds with "ock." I, I heard something else. Yeah, yeah. I was looking around for one of these for my son, and because uh, he was playing with the little communicator that came with his little Captain Kirk figure that he has, and yes, I'm obviously not setting my son up to have a very successful future. 
having him at age three into all this original Star Trek stuff. But he took this out of the package this morning when it came and immediately opened it up and was yelling, Spock, Spock, into it. So he knows what it's for. He'll have a fine career as a uh, cosplayer. Yeah. 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 oh you know i looked for a a holster for it because he was trying to stick it into his pajama pants and it was falling down his leg onto the floor every time and uh like oh you know a cheap holster for this will be like five bucks nothing on amazon find it on ebay they're made by hand 79 dollars, and then on etsy they were 80 and up like all right forget it we're gonna use duct tape it's a holster specifically for this product well, there's the the nicer one. If you've seen it, there's like a hundred and fifty ish dollar Bluetooth one you can use as a Bluetooth uh, answer, like oh, for your okay. phone. Okay. We sold it at Best Buy for a while, but I don't know if the yeah, sizing is the same. Bucks at all. More, is, you get a really tricorder. I know. I saw the tricorder. They have a tricorder and a phaser. It's all just plastic stuff, but it has sound effects. So if you want to role play around your house, you know, and just get it while you can, because these have been jumping up in price. The cheapest one of these little communicators on eBay was $40 plus shipping. And that was like still there. People were still bidding on it. You can buy it for like $30 on Amazon right now. Brand new. All right. Well, that's the show. Uh, We hope we put a good show together for you folks. Uh, We, like I said, we do this Wednesday nights normally uh, 10 PM Eastern. And uh, you can find the edited version of the show. What we do is we go through and, uh, put in a a rundown on the side with the topics and show notes and links and all that. And those go up the day after Uh, I normally edit overnight and get it ready in the morning. I'm exhausted. So that'll probably be up tomorrow. uh, That's Thursday uh, in the afternoon or so. Uh, So check pcper.com slash podcast for that. And also, like we said at the beginning of the show, the, if you go right now, the site is still the traditional good old pcper.com. But at some point this weekend, if you visit, uh, you'll you'll uh, refresh the page and see something very different. And you got a little taste of that as we showed some articles in that new interface and that new design uh, this evening. So please let us know what you think. Please bang on it and and tell us what uh, what's wrong. There, I'm sure there will be things that are wrong because the the structure of the data was so different and we had to do so much work to try to try to get it into a modern CMS. And uh, we, we think we got it, but please don't hesitate to let us know if you've encountered issues. If things don't look right or don't work right, uh, we would appreciate that. Um, that's it for tonight. Thanks so much. I uh, hope everyone has a great week. We'll see you next time.